Uh, today I'm going to talk about the uh, remote sensing of uh, quiz classes that I have been working on in the past uh, several years. Uh, before I, I start, I want to uh, emphasize that this is a truly a team effort, and it would not have been possible without uh, contribution from many of my colleagues and uh, collaborators. So just an outline of, for my talk today. Uh, much of the talk will be about uh, sulfur dioxide, or SO2. So I'll give a little bit of background on uh, why we're interested in SO2 and what has uh, been done in the past. And I'll introduce our uh, retrieval technique. Uh, it's based on the principal component analysis, the PCA, uh, based uh, retrieval technique. I'll show some res uh, results uh, for uh, Retrievals for the anthropogenic, or sometimes we call it the boundary layer SO2, using Aura OMI and uh, SUMI MPP arms. Those are our uh, two uh, uh, main instruments that we work with. And then I'll, of course, show some science analysis of the data set. Then I'll talk a little bit about, uh, about uh, the volcanic SO2 retrievals using the two instruments and uh, what we are currently working on to further improve the retrievals and to extend our data set and also, uh, very briefly, the application of the retrieval technique to other species. So, uh, SO2 is a very important toxic air pollutant. It's actually one of the designated uh, pollutants regulated by the US EPA and uh, many other uh, environment agencies. SO2 is mainly emitted from uh, anthropogenic activities for example, uh, the burning of uh, sulfur contain, uh, containing fuels and the metal smelters. And uh, it also has uh, quite sizable emissions from uh, volcanic activities, including both uh, continuously degassing volcanoes and also uh, episodically we got those uh, large eruptions. So SO2, uh, in addition to its own, uh, its own uh, in uh, being a, uh, 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 designated air pollutant, it also forms sulfate aerosols in the atmosphere. And of course, we know that sulfate aerosols have very important effects on the particulate matter of PM pollution that has the adverse health effects. Uh, also, uh, affects our visibility. And it's also acid deposition of sulfate species that can affect the ecosystems. And then there's uh, climate effects of sulfate aerosols through the direct and the indirect radiative effects. So we can actually retrieve SO2 from both uh, infrared uh, IR and uh, ultraviolet or UV instruments from the space. Today's talk will be uh, focused on the UV retrievals. And the diagram here uh, basically gives you some idea about the physical processes that we uh, have to consider in our retrievals. So the sun is our light source. And uh, with this temperature, it has this uh, UV visible radiation. And um, our measurement uh, is from the, uh, the so-called UV vis spectrometers in space as the backscatter solar radiation to the top of the atmosphere. But before uh, the photons get backscattered and uh, measured by our instruments, it can actually go through uh, many different uh, processes. Those include uh, absorption by ozone and uh, NO2 in the stratosphere and also including uh, scattering by the oxygen and uh, nitrogen molecules. Those include both the radii scattering and the uh, inelastic uh, Raman scattering that we have to consider. And then there's also interaction with aerosols and clouds. So what we're interested in is the absorption by the potent gases in the troposphere. But, but to, to get to that signal, we have to account for all different uh, factors. Uh, before I get to the retrievals, I also want to make a point that our retrieved parameter is the uh, so-called atmospheric uh, total column amount. So it's uh, the number of uh, molecules over a unit area in the entire atmospheric column from the surface to the top of the atmosphere. And we often use this uh, Dobson unit uh, to represent our results. So there's also actually a little bit of history on the, def on the definition of, about this Dobson unit. Uh, if you're, you're interested, you, you can read uh, those uh, from the uh, Ozone Watch website. But for now, <coughs> just remember, on average in the atmosphere, we have about 300 Dobson units of ozone. And for the pollution that we're uh, interested in, it's a 
often just around one DU or even less. And uh, the volcanic SO2 can be highly variable. Okay, so you can have as little as just a few thousand units, but in some extreme cases, you can have a thousand thousand units of SO2. So uh, this is our heritage. About 35 years ago, Alan Kruger, uh, he for the first time demonstrated uh, uh, retrievals of SO2 from space. This is from the uh, Al Chichang eruption in 1982 uh, in, uh, in Mexico. And uh, he was using this instrument called Total Ozone Mapping Spectrometer, or TOMS. So by its name, you can tell the instrument was designed to map ozone. And the, map, uh, the plot here shows why uh, he can get SO2 from this. So uh, let's uh, take a closer look. So, so what I plot here, uh, the, uh, the black line and the red line, are the absorption cross-section by, by SO2 and ozone in our spectral range of interest, which is the 310 to a roughly 340 nanometer. And uh, the green line is the ratio between these two cross-sections. And the uh, vertical blue lines are the TOMS channels. So if you look closely, you can see that at the shorter wavelengths, for example, 313 or 317 nanometer, SO2 is more strongly absorbing. While at the longer wavelengths, 331, ozone is more strongly absorbing. So normally, you don't have much SO2 in the atmosphere, so that you can get, uh, SO, uh, get ozone. But when there is a large eruption like Al Chichang, you have hundreds of thousand units of SO2 in the atmosphere, and that causes a strong signal in a short, at shorter wavelengths. So by using these uh, different uh, spectral absorption features, you can quantify both ozone and SO2. This is also the foundation of all what we are doing today. So the TOMS instruments, actually, there are uh, four of them, I think. And the, the data record goes back to the late 1970s and to uh, uh, early 2000s. So the TOMS instruments don't have just a single PMT detector and they're making measurements at just the six wavelengths. And uh, the data product you got from TOMS is the ozone column and SO2 column amount from uh, large eruptions. In the mid-1990s, there was a major breakthrough with the launch of this GOM instrument. It's a, on a European satellite. So GOM and all the follow-up uh, instruments in the morning polar orbits, they all have this 1D array detector, which can measure, instead of just six wavelengths, which can, those instruments can measure hundreds of wavelengths. And for the first time, the, uh, uh, the community was able to demonstrate retrievals of NO2, pollution SO2 from all height, and um, other species. So in 2004, there was another major advance in the field. That's what the launch of the ozone monitoring instrument, OMI, on NASA AURA satellite. So OMI uh, is uh, revolutionary in the sense that it's the first uh, uh, push broom UV visible spectrometer with 2D CCD detector. So what that allows us to do is to make uh, measurements at hundreds of wavelengths and uh, provide a global daily coverage and also at, a, at that time unprecedented uh, spatial resolution, about 13 times 24 kilometer at the nadir of the orbit. And uh, after uh, OMI, in 2011, there was a launch of uh, the, the ARMS instrument on the NASA NOAA SUMI MPP satellite which is similar to OMI, but uh, has a closer spatial resolution. Last year, they launched another ARMS instrument on NOAA 20, which has a spatial resolution that's comparable with OMI. And of course, uh, to our community, what's really exciting last year was the launch of this uh, chart OMI instrument on European Sentinel-5 precursor um, satellite. So, so this is so far the highest resolution we could achieve for this type of instrument in space. So today I'm going to mainly talk, uh, as I mentioned, mainly talk about the uh, results from OMI and SUMI MPP arms retrievals. But I'm also going to have some results for all these uh, different uh, sensors. So it's actually uh, quite a challenge to uh, try to get uh, pollution SO2 from space measurements. So here I'm showing the results of uh, two radiative transfer calculations. So the blue line here is for the uh, calculation with just the radius scatter and ozone absorption. And uh, in the red lines, the same radius and ozone, but I add 2,000 units of SO2 
which is actually quite substantial for pollution sources. And the result I show in n value, which is basically the logarithm of the sun normalized radiancy. So we can barely see there are actually two lines. They almost overlap. And if you take the difference between the two, that's our SO2 signal. So in terms of a signal in n value, we're looking at a 0.2 signal, 0.2 n value, as compared with about 150. So indeed, we're dealing with pretty weak signals. And on top of that, we have to worry about uh, instrument and measurement artifacts and all those in our retrievals. So how do we overcome this challenge? Well, the approach is to utilize the spectral information. So to uh, demonstrate our approach, let me start with this uh, more commonly used uh, DUAS approach. It's a differential optical absorption spectroscopy. And uh, this is a DUAS equation. So on the left-hand side, you have uh, measured sun normalized radiances. That's your measurement. On the right-hand side, you have the cross-section from different uh, gas absorbers, for example, ozone and SO2. And you have a polynomial term that, that uh, accounts for the uh, effects of uh, those low-frequency features such as radiant mist scattering and the surface reflectance. And you also have this uh, rota rotational Raman scattering, also called the ring effect. Oftentimes, you also need the additional term on the right-hand side to account for the effects of, uh, say, measurement artifacts such as wavelength shift, stray light. So the idea is that if you fit all these different uh, spectral features, cross-sections to your measurement, you can get an estimate of the loading of your target species. So the DUAS approach utilizes the full spectral content. Normally, you have uh, 100 or more wavelengths in the spectral range that you do the fitting. But as you can imagine, some of those terms on the right-hand side can actually be quite difficult to model accurately. For example, the Raman scattering in the uh, SO2 spectral range and also the measurement artifacts, that can be difficult to model as well. So instead of uh, trying to do this uh, explicit modeling of all those different uh, interference, ozone, Raman scattering, and instrument features. Our PCA-based approach is a data-driven approach. And so here is uh, basically our uh, equation here. It's kind of a similar to the DUAS equation. On the left-hand left -hand side, you still have the measured radiances. Imagine if you can do, if you have a lot of measurements of uh, spectral over a uh, uh, SO2 free region. For example, we don't have much SO2 normally over the equatorial Pacific. You do a PCA analysis to that data set, and uh, what you can get in the form of a principal component of PCs are the spectral features associated with different processes. I'm, I'm going to give an example a little bit later. So those are associated with different uh, interference that affect our SO2 retrievals. Now, if we put some of those principal components on the right-hand side of the equation, and then you add the SO2 term with the SO2 Jacobians, which is basically your measurement sensitivity to a perturbation in the SO2 column amount, and then you fit everything on the right-hand side to your measured radiance spectrum, and you can get the weight of those principal components and your SO2 column amount at the same time. So I want to say a few more words about the S2 Jacobians. The S2 Jacobians are determined with a radiative transfer calculation, and they depend on several factors, and very importantly, on the profiles, because the instrument is more sensitive to SO2 at higher altitudes. But from just our measurements, sometimes it's, uh, you don't have that information from our measurements. So what we do is that we estimate a few different uh, total column amounts of SO2. So those are still total column amounts, but those are based on different uh, a priori profiles. For example, when I talk about the PBL or boundary layer SO2, I'm not talking about uh, SO2 just in the boundary layer. It's actually a total column estimate, but assuming that SO2 is in the lowest one kilometer of the atmosphere. And uh, similarly, for the gas in volcanoes, we often assume a three kilometer uh, profile 
and for large volcanic eruptions, we assume eight and 18 kilometer profile. So those are all uh, total column retrievals. Now this is a busy plot. I'm going to walk you through this. And uh, this is our principal components that we derive from measurements over the Pacific. And uh, so the first principal component, the black line in panel A, is essentially just the mean uh, spectrum. And the second one, the black line in panel B, is highly correlated with the green line here, which is the ozone cross-section, the lab measured cross-section. So we know the second one is associated with uh, ozone absorption. And the third one has some low frequency feature, and we think it's associated with, uh, for example, surface reflectance. If you compare it uh, with the reference uh, Raman scattering spectrum, the blue line here, see there are some similarities. So it also has some ring signature in this uh, uh, principal component. The fourth and the fifth ones, they, uh, they have some high frequency, uh, high frequency features, and we think they are probably a measurement artifacts. But just five of these principal components uh, I already explain a lot, very large fraction of the spectral variance in the data set. So we can feed those principal components to, a, to the measured radiance data. And we can calculate the residuals, that's what the panel D issue. So we have two fittings here. The black line is from the fitting residuals without including the SO2 term in our equation. And the red line includes the SO2 term. So you can see that for wavelengths at which, and the blue, uh, green line here is the SO2 cross-section. So at a wavelength uh, which uh, SO2 does not strongly absorb, you can see there's a very little difference between these two fittings. On the other hand, for those uh, SO2 peak absorbing wave wavelengths, you can see that including the SO2 term actually reduces the uh, fitting residual, which means that this uh, particular pixel has some SO2. And indeed, it's uh, just downwind of the Kilauea uh, volcano in Hawaii. So, we, so we, we, we do detect SO2 from this particular pixel. So uh, this uh, PCA-based retrieval, uh, retrieval algorithm is now our operational algorithm for NASA standard OMI SO2 product. And uh, the map here on the top shows the mean uh, boundary layer SO2 retrieved with the PCA algorithm for August 2006. And uh, the, lower panel, uh, the lower map here is from our previous uh, operational product. It's based on the, this uh, BRD algorithm. So uh, the BRD algorithm, instead of uh, using hundreds of wavelengths, just use two pairs of wavelengths. So you can see that in both algorithms, you can find hot spot, for example, over the Persian Gulf and from over the Eastern US and then Eastern China. But on the other hand, you see that the PC algorithm significantly reduced the artifacts and noise. In fact, if we can calculate the, oh, sorry. In fact, if we can calculate the, uh, root mean square error over this, uh, for different latitude bands over this uh, remote uh, Pacific area, which we assume has very little SO2, you can see we're looking at uh, about a factor of two uh, reduction in the retrieval noise. So this is uh, considered a major uh, improvement in our data set. Now with this uh, improved data set, our, uh, we can look at the uh, emission sources of SO2. So our uh, colleagues at uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada, uh, Vitaly Fialatov and uh, Chris McLinden, they develop a uh, method that combines the wind information and uh, our PCA-based SO2 retrievals to estimate uh, SO2 emissions from large point sources. Turns out uh, from OMI, we can estimate emissions for about 500 sources globally uh, on an annual basis. So these are the, all the locations and the types of these sources. Uh, you have power plants, oil and gas, and the smelters, also volcanoes. And you can, down, so, so you can, so this OMI-based emission database, you can download it from our SO2 website. 
one advantage of this uh, OMI based top down approach is that you don't have to know beforehand where the emission sources are. So if you compare that with uh, bottom up, conventional bottom up emission inventories, you will be able to find that about 40 of these sources are missing or underreported in all the uh, in this uh, bottom up inventories. So the location of these sources are marked by the circles on the map, and the color is the this missing the ratio between these missing uh, sources and the bottom up estimate uh, emissions for the country. So globally, these 40 or so missing sources only account for about uh, 6 to 12 percent of uh, anthropogenic emissions, but regionally it can be quite important. It can be about 100 percent over the Persian Gulf. So imagine if you have a chemical transport model and you try to uh, simulate SO2 and sulfate, then you are going to have some bias because of this, uh, uh, all the missing sources. So we were also able to get uh, estimates for about the 90 degassing volcanoes, and the comparison with the commonly used database for aerosol models also show there's a large difference between OMI-based estimates and uh, those uh, commonly used model, model uh, uh, database by the models. With the global coverage of OMI, we can also look at uh, trends of SO2 pollution over different uh, regions. So here I'm showing the uh, uh, SO2, boundary layer SO2 retrievals annual average for uh, 2005 and 2016. And then masking out this uh, South Atlantic anomaly area, this is the area where our sensors are affected and uh, uh, have quite high noise in the radiance data and, the, uh, and also that causes the high noise in the retrievals. So I'll get to that a little bit later. But if you compare these two years, you can see that there's a significant reduction in the OMI uh, observed SO2 over eastern China and over eastern US. And there's some increase over India. So if we, let's first uh, zoom into uh, the eastern US. So those are the three year I mean, annual mean uh, SO2 uh, OMI SO2 over the eastern US. So at the beginning of this OMI mission, you see there's uh, quite some SO2 strong signals uh, from this Ohio River Valley, where we know there's uh, quite some, uh, there are quite some uh, coal-fired power plants. So it's very substantial SO2 emissions. Similarly for this uh, Atlantic, uh, Atlant <laughs> Atlanta and the surrounding suburb areas. But near the end of uh, OMI mission, not at the end, but in more recent years, well, uh, we don't, we can barely detect any SO2 over uh, this area. So according to OMI data, there was about 75% decrease in SO2 over the eastern US from 2005 to 2015. And that trend matches well with a bottom-up emission inventory. And that's because of the, uh, uh, for one thing, they uh, further reduce the uh, uh, emission. They put scrubbers on the power plants, for example. And uh, some of the power plants, I think, because the natural gas became cheaper. So natural gas uh, does not, if you bring it, it does not emit a whole lot of SO2. Do you have to find out the well, I mean, uh, the inventory may not, well, I think the EPA, uh, I think they update their inventory like every three years. Sometimes you have interpolation. So it does not necessarily just a uh, cat, yeah. Well, for the power plants, the data is annual <laughs> with yeah. uh, monitoring, but for the other mm -hmm. sectors, exactly, it's interpolated. So. Yeah. A lot of industry in there, then there can be more discrepancy, but on both sides. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, this only observed a uh, large reduction in SO2 over the eastern U.S. I was also recently uh, highlighted, or very excited about that, 
so uh, highlighted by the uh, USDA in their 2018 air trends uh, report. So it's not very often you got uh, satellite data being featured in uh, EPA documents. So uh, with this reduction SO2, you would expect some uh, benefits, environmental benefits. Uh, but the problem is how to quantify those. And uh, Nikita Falkin, he's a graduate student working with us. He uh, recently did a case study for the uh, uh, acid deposition or sulfate deposition. So again, the map on the left here shows you the OMI observed SO2 trend uh, during 2005 to 2015. And the right map on the right is the sulfate deposition trend. It's from a, a surface monitoring uh, network called, uh, called uh, NADP. So if you look at these two, you see there's some similarities, but it does not uh, match exactly. So what Nikita did was to use a trajectory model to try to establish the source receptor relationship. And then you combine that with uh, OMI and the surface measurement data. And you try to determine areas where the emission reductions have contributed to the observed uh, trend in sulfate deposition. So the map on the left here shows the uh, one example for Beltsville, just a few miles from us. And uh, for this particular site, you can see that uh, reductions both within Maryland, the state of Maryland, and out of Maryland, uh, you know, uh, over Western Pennsylvania, Ohio River Valley, those reductions from all those areas have contributed to the decrease in sulfate deposition at Beltsville. So uh, now let's uh, move uh, to, uh, to East Asia and South Asia, where we are fairly aware of the, the, uh, the haze issues there. So if you compare, again, the OMI retrievals for 2005 and 2016, you can see that there's large, very large decrease in SO2 observed by OMI between these two years. And at the same time, there was substantial increase over India. So we want to look at the factors. What are actually the factors that are driving those changes? And what are the uh, implications? So we start from our OMI-based uh, emission database. Re uh, remember, those are for large point sources. So we can calculate the total emissions from those sources from our database. But OMI is not sensitive enough to detect those smaller sources. So we have to compare our estimates from OMI with the bottom-up inventories. And with that, we can come up with a correcting factor to correct our estimates. And, and the, those corrected uh, annual to, uh, total uh, emissions for China and India are the red and the blue lines here. And, the, and the, because we, correct, we compare to different uh, bottom-up inventories, so, that, so we have different uh, emission fact, uh, correcting factors. So that's uh, where the error bars come from. And uh, the, black, uh, the blue, black lines here are, the, are one of the bottom-up inventories. And the vertical bars are the projected emission level for 2015 from fairly recent literature. So you can see that since uh, 2013, 2014, there was really sharp decrease in our estimated SO2 emissions to the le level far lower than the projections. And at the same time, there's an increase uh, from India. So the Arab still overlap, but it uh, looks like India is becoming the, uh, the top anthropogenic SO2 emitter in the whole world. We can also calculate the ratio between our estimated emissions and the co-consumption. That gives us some idea about the emission factor from co-combustion. So before 2007, you can see the ratio are fairly comparable between the two countries. And there was not much SO2 control in, in both of them. But after that, you can see the ratio is fairly stable for India. So there, there is still not much SO2 control going on in India. On the other hand, for China, you can see a very sharp drop. So that means there is a fairly efficient SO2 control in China. And we can also estimate the uh, emission ratio between SO2 and CO2 from this ratio. So Sanchi and Russ Dickerson, they led a field campaign in May 2016 over uh, one of the most polluted areas in northern China. During the course, they encountered, they measured many, many uh, plumes in the boundary layer. And uh, their measured SO2 and CO2 ratio is actually fairly comparable with our estimate. 
So both satellite uh, data and the field campaign also they suggest that there's a very efficient SO2 control in China. So what are the consequences? Well, to calculate the population weighted SO2, again, you see sharp decrease in China and a gradual increase in India. We also estimated the population exposed to relatively heavy SO2 pollution, which here is defined by over 0.5 DU in annual SO2. And you can see the population exposed to this uh, SO2 pollution decreased uh, in China by a, more than a factor of four in just four years. So that's really a very, very significant uh, change. But with all that decreasing SO2, haze can still sometimes be very severe in China. So the implication is that just cutting the SO2 is not enough. Now they have done the easy job of cutting SO2, putting the scrubbers to the, uh, to the power plants. They have to do more to cut other emissions of other pollutants. As for India, you can expect the air quality issue may become more severe because you ha now you have this industrial pollution on top of all different uh, sources. And uh, so, so something needs to be done before things get worse. So again, with this large uh, reduction of SO2 emissions from China, what are the large scale uh, implications? So from OMI, we can actually try to detect as to, uh, the, the export of a large S2 plume from China. And in some cases, we can even track those plumes for multiple days before it travels into the Pacific Ocean or even uh, across the Pacific. Uh, because since 2009, OMI has lost some uh, spatial coverage because of the instrumental issues. And uh, now we, are, we also look at our arms retrievals for later years. And uh, the bar, vertical bars here show the, our estimated SO2 export from this large uh, transport event for different years. And the red numbers are the number of events we detect. So normally we detect about 80 to 100 SO2 export events. And uh, those account for about 1 to 3% of the total SO2 emissions from China. But since 2014, we see a very sharp drop of those large export events. So that must have some consequence on the, for example, aerosols and clouds in downwind areas. And that's something that we are interested in looking into. It's out of China. Yeah. So uh, our OMI emission database is for the large point sources. And it's actually can be very tricky for modelers to use them. So uh, our colleague, Fei Liu, she's in the audience today. And what she did is actually to try to combine the OMI-based emission data with uh, bottom-up emission inventory, in this case, the HTOP inventory, to come up with a new hybrid emission inventory. So that's the estimated emissions in the inventory for 2010. And that's the difference between the hybrid inventory OMI HTOP and the uh, original HTOP inventory. So, so, this, so you can see this is where OMI actually uh, made a, make, uh, makes a difference in the emissions. So, uh, how, well, so you have this new emission inventory, you put it to test. So uh, they and uh, our co-authors uh, conducted uh, simulations using the NASA GEOS-5 model and then compare the model simulated surface SO2 with ground monitors in the US. So this on the left is the original HTOP inventory, the results, and on the right is the new inventory. You can see there's a large re, uh, reduction in the model bias using the new inventory. And those uh, blue dots, especially for those blue dots, those are actually the gray cells where OMI makes a difference. So uh, the paper was just accepted in ACP, and you can get the uh, emission inventory from Fei if you are interested. So OE is now in its 14th year, going to 15th. And uh, as I mentioned, already lost some spatial coverage. So it's important to continue this data set. So we are, also, we are now also producing a, a SO2 retrievals using the same algorithm, but with the SUMI MPP ARMS instrument. So the map here shows the annual SO2 retrieved from arms 
for 2012. If we calculate the daily SO2 loading within this black box here, we can plot that from ohm and from ounce. You can see these two track each other fairly well. So, so indeed, we can continue uh, the, the OMI data with SUMI MPP ounce. The scatter plot here is the same data, the blue triangles. Again, you can see the correlation about 0.85. And the red dots are the improvements we are currently working on for both <laughs> retrievals. And uh, they, we expect that to further enhance the consistency between the two with correlation coefficient going up to 0.9. And uh, the PC algorithm is also what we use now to retrieve volcanic SO2 from OMI. So here is a, just a comparison between uh, retrievals for August 5th, 2006, uh, between our current operational PC uh, retrievals and uh, our previous operational product based on the linear fleet algorithm, which, like the BRD algorithm, also used just a small number of wavelengths. And you can see there's a very large reduction in noise and the artifacts. Indeed, if we, compare, uh, if we uh, calculate the standard deviation over the Pacific uh, again, you can see there's a factor of two reduction in noise uh, in the PCA retrievals. Uh, the other improvement uh, we made with this uh, PCA algorithm is for very large volcanic SO2. The previous algorithm is known to underestimate SO2 for, for those kind of scenarios, for example, uh, this uh, Sierra Negra eruption in 2005, the, uh, the previous algorithm, uh, the, the, the max SO2 is only in 240 deep, uh, adopting units, which, is, which has been shown to uh, be too low. And in our new retrie uh, PCA retrievals, we got uh, over 1,100 adopting units. So this is the, so far the largest we uh, get in the OMI data record. And we are also trying to continue the volcanic SO2 data from OMI using SUMI MPP ounce. This is the uh, calculated daily SO2 mass uh, within a domain near the Kilauea uh, volcano in Hawaii. So the, the black uh, triangles are from OMI and the red lines from ounce. You can see that we are continuing this uh, OMI time series. If we plot a, uh, make a scatter plot here, you can see that we have a correlation coefficient of about 0.9. So indeed, they are fairly consistent. We also look at the uh, compare the daily distrib spatial distribution on a daily basis between the two instruments. And for most of the days, we have correlation coefficient of about 0.8, which means that we're basically detecting the SO2 plume at about the same location. So that's for the degassing volcanoes. How about large eruptions? So this is actually one example from the Kaluti eruption in 2014, one of the larger ones in the ARMS uh, era. And uh, as, so for OMI, because we lost a part of the spatial coverage, so for this entire plume, our estimated SO2 mass is lower than the ARMS, which provides us uh, full coverage of the plume. So we can combine these two by assigning ARMS values to the, to the OMI pixels for those missing, uh, with, with the missing data, and we have this merged OMI plus ounce. So that gives us full coverage plus some uh, fine spatial uh, details. So if we compare this, the merged data set with our ounce data set, you can see that the estimated SO2 agrees to within 3%. So that shows that we are really get very consistent results between the two instruments. Yeah. They are about the same time. They are about, uh, I think, uh, maybe up to 15 minutes apart. Sometimes it gets, yeah, 15. So uh, what we are currently working on is to make uh, further improvements to the retrievals, especially we are working on the new Jacobians for the boundary layer SO2 retrievals. And we are trying to extend our data set by going back to uh, missions before OMI and uh, moving forward with the new instruments that I mentioned. So uh, we are currently impl implementing a new lookup table for S2 Jacobians to more accurately account for the effects of uh, geometry, uh, uh, elevation, and all different uh, factors. And uh, we're also paying special attention to pixels covered by snow ice. So 
the map here is for the eastern US from our previous operational product, our current operational product, and what to expect from our uh, new product, which we hope to release later this year or early next year. So you can see there's uh, improvement uh, in our current uh, operational product versus uh, pr previous product, but we expect that we are going to have further reduced retrieval noise and artifacts in our new product. And here are some also some preliminary results. So the map on the top, so this is for July 2005, the monthly SO2. Top, uh, the map on the top shows our current boundary layer SO2 retrievals. And uh, we made some uh, changes to our algorithm. And uh, so for using the same Jacobians, so it's a fair comparison between the two, you can see that we reduced the noise over the, this uh, South Atlantic anomaly area. And with the new Jacobians, we further uh, reduce the retrieval artifacts and uh, noise. And uh, this is just a closer up look uh, for the comparison between our new version on the current operational PCA version. And uh, for China, for different months, January, April, July, and October. And see, in terms of the spatial distribution and the seasonal cycle, the two look uh, fairly similar. But uh, with the new Jacobians, we are uh, reducing uh, the noise, especially over the less polluted areas. Just another example of our preliminary results, this time for Norisk in Russia, which is the largest uh, anthropogenic source in the world. It has uh, several big smelters. And, uh, and on the, in the bottom are the retrievals, our current operational retrievals, for April and July 2005. So you can see there's April retrievals are much, much higher than July, which is not realistic. That's because there's a snow and ice on the ground that we currently do not uh, properly account, if, account for. But in the new retrievals, uh, new Jacobians, you can see these two are now more comparable, so that's more realistic. So, uh, so far, we have uh, talked about our OMI's, uh, the NASA EOS standard product, and our SUMI MPP ARMS, that's the uh, EOS continuity product. And uh, I was just uh, looking at uh, some other sensors and the, the data from the new instruments. So let's first go back to Skiamagi, which was launched uh, in 2002, and uh, it has a uh, a ground resolution comparable to that of uh, SUMI MPP arms, but it has it covers the globe uh, once in about six days, so it's uh, much uh, less measurements. And uh, this is our preliminary result for boundary layer as to the retrievals for Skiamaki for 2004. You can see it actually looks quite similar to our OMI and arms uh, uh, maps, and uh, you can see the pollution over eastern China, the Persian Gulf, uh, South Africa, and uh, eastern US a little bit and also Mexico City and the Kilauea uh, volcano in Hawaii. So maybe that's not going back far enough. Uh, let's move to GOM, which was launched in 1995. And uh, it has a really coarse spatial resolution. It's 40 by 320 kilometers, so the pixel is really large. And uh, it covers the globe uh, once every about three days. But from that, we can still get some information. So that's our retri preliminary retrievals for 1997. And you can see uh, sources in eastern Ch uh, China and uh, eastern US, South Africa. So you can still get something out of that. So we can go further back to the Tom's data record. So I'm not going to claim that we can get anthropogenic SO2 from Tom's, but this is just to show you that the PCA retrieval technique works with just six wavelengths from Tom's. So you don't necessarily have to ha have hundreds of wavelengths for this approach to work. And this is just a plume from the Pinatubo eruption in 1991. And this is a zoomed in look. This is the results actually compare very, uh, fairly well with another algorithm currently being worked on at NASA Goddard for times. How about the new sensors? So we have tested our algorithm without doing much uh, tweaking. Uh, on the JPS S1 NOAA 20 arms, and that's the first SO2 retrievals from NOAA 20 arms. It's for the Fugo eruption in February this year. 
and it's not a very large eruption with just a few kilotons of SO2 ejected. And, uh, and uh, for this particular uh, case, the RRO, the OMI and the SUMI MPV arms, uh, spatial resolution is not that great, so we don't uh, get a, a lot. But uh, NOAA 20 arms was operating at a 10 by 10 kilometer spatial resolution. So, so the, the footprints are plotted here. You can see that it actually gives us uh, some fine details of the eruption. Well, I, I think it's more related to the part of the boom that uh, uh, the arm the pixel is too large to see. So, of course, what's really exciting to the field is the launch of the top home instrument on uh, S5P satellite. So, the, so Nicholas Tace at Vera, he's the PI for the top home uh, SO2 product for which he developed the latest and the greatest dual space retrieval algorithm. And this is his first uh, retrieval. It's for the argon eruption in Indonesia uh, in November last year. So you can see that with the fine uh, spatial resolution from Tropom, you get a lot of detail of this uh, 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 volcanic plume. For the comparison, we can aggregate Tropom pixels to our arms pixels. So for each arms pixels, there are about 100 uh, trap home pixels. That gives you some idea how good the spatial resolution trap home has. But if you look at the spatial uh, distribution after this aggregation, you can see it's uh, very, very consistent between the two. And uh, by the way, I mentioned to Django that uh, the overpass time is only five minutes apart. So this is almost a measurement at the same time. So if we make a scatter plot, remember we're comparing two different instruments, two different algorithms. And uh, you don't get much better than that. You've got correlation coefficient almost one, slope almost one. So that's very encouraging. Yeah, too good to be true. Volcanoes are great. Oh, it's no, it's no fluke. Well, the proof is here. Because the top of me team just recently uh, released their near real time SO2 product. And uh, Simon Karen, his uh, collaborator at Michigan Tech, he just downloaded the data from the website, and he makes the plot himself for the Sopotan eruption earlier this month in Indonesia. And uh, again, it's not a very large eruption, but again, you see the spatial distribution, very similar between the two, despite the different uh, spatial resolution, and also the estimated SO2 mass within the plume agree within about 10%. So again, uh, we are quite uh, encouraged by this comparison. So another major development for our community is the upcoming geostationary constellation for air quality. Those include the NASA Temple instruments over North America and the Central 4 over Europe and also the GEMS instrument um, uh, over East Asia. So though those instruments will may be making much high frequency measurements temporarily about hourly measurements instead of a once a day measurements. So it will, so again, you have much more, you will have, expect to have much more data to build on the noise and get the emission estimates. And we're currently working with the GEMS team to help them to get ready before their launch in late 2019 or early 2020. So just uh, very briefly, uh, for formaldehyde, the formaldehyde actually can uh, provide some information on the sources of uh, VOCs. Those are precursors for tropospheric ozone pollution and also organic aerosols. And from that, and uh, formaldehyde has been retrieved with some other instruments, but using this technique, we were able to demonstrate uh, retrievals of formaldehyde using SUMI MVP arms for the first time. And uh, so uh, we're getting, uh, so we're also working on some other instruments for formaldehyde retrievals. So uh, these are my conclusions. So the PCA-based retrieval technique is a data-driven approach. And uh, the, as you 
probably gather that the main advantage is that it provides very consistent data record between different instruments. That's good for the long-term data record. And it can be applied to more than just ISO 2, can be applied to other species. What I'm currently working on is to get a long-term data record for SO2 and maybe for formaldehyde. And we are also looking to uh, implement our SO, uh, retrieval algorithm with the new generation sensors. And there are a lot of uh, signs you can do with this uh, data set. So with that, I'll uh, stop here. Questions? <laughs> I had uh, two questions about the PCI tech, PCA technique. Uh, actually, one comment. So over the oceans, you assume there's no SO2 and there's, there's less. But I wanted to mention that there's a community. Um, so there's emissions from ships, which are, can be quite significant where, where the ships are. And there is a community that estimates those using the ship tracking devices to high spatial and temporal resolution. So I wonder if it might make sense to try to do the ocean calibration, excluding those pixels and times where the ships are present. And I wonder, so may, that might be an interesting thing to try to see if maybe that would improve. And then second part is actually related. So you, you, dem you showed the PCA technique and you mentioned, for example, the surface reflectance component. Mm -hmm. But that's over ocean and I would expect some of those components might be very different over land, mm -hmm. where it's different. So could you comment? Okay. So uh, first, uh, uh, about the ship, truck, uh, ship emissions, uh, there's one study showing that it, it may be possible to detect that from uh, satellites. It's uh, by Nicholas uh, paper, uh, but that's uh, averaging four years of OMI data but, over the Red Sea. Yeah, so, but my, my comment was the other way around, that we actually know where the ships are. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So you could exclude that from your calibration. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, you have to use non-satellite data, but it's still has very good right. data, so it could be used. Okay. Yeah, that, that could be useful. On the other hand, in our actual implementation of the algorithm, we just have the principal components that explain the most of variance, right, in the in the in the fitting. And uh, oftentimes, it's it's the case that SO2 is not very significant. So it does not contribute a whole lot to the spectral variance. So in the actual implementation of the algorithm, we actually do this PCA training for all the orbits on an orbital basis. And uh, unless there's a really large eruption, you don't see the SO2 signature in the first few principal components that you'll get. So, so in, in essence, it's, it's not making a significant contribution to the training, the, the ship emission. I know, yes, as I mentioned, we are doing this uh, on an orbital basis, so it's everything. It's not just training over the, uh, say, the Pacific Ocean. So we, we, are, we, are, we are doing this PCA analysis on the fly, and uh, turns out that's actually better uh, in accounting for other factors such as the dark current, because that can change it, change it from uh, one orbit to another. So we are doing that training over land and over ocean, just not just the ocean. Okay, um, you didn't uh, mention much about uh, the vertical profile of SO2. Yeah. Associated with that is the cloud height. Uh -huh. So I would assume these are very critical information, and uh, and uh, you, if you do not account for that, how much, in particular, if you try to get SO2 in the boundary layer, this may be a very critical issue. Yeah. So that's why we are uh, currently uh, working on this new version, which we do use a uh, model a priori profiles and uh, use the uh, cloud retrieval from OMI so based on the Raman scattering so developed by Joanna Joyner. And uh, so try to use that. But it's actually uh, add to the, I would say, add to the complexity of the problem, but not necessarily <laughs> give you better results. So the, the result you show for the boundary layer SO2 must be clear sky on. Uh, the monthly means are all, just so you have a threshold for the cloud fraction. So you, you so you aggregate the data. You you, you do a data grading, selecting those uh, pixels with a small cloud fraction. Yeah, that's right. So, so you, that's the last you, you factor. Have to be just clear sky. Uh, effectively, yeah, you, you well, yeah. You, I mean, you don't get a modest sense of <laughs> clear sky, but uh, for OMI, uh, because the footprint is much larger than modest, so 
So it's as you know, there is a trade-off. So you, you can tolerate a little bit of a cloud, cloud, but not too much. Right. And can you use a different layer of cloud to get to the vertical profile? Oh, cloud slicing, right? Yeah. Uh, that's possible, but that's only for, for example, volcanic when there is SO2 actually above the cloud, or for long range transport, you get a little bit of a cloud information, uh, a height information from the cloud. So above the cloud, you see something, but you assume you don't see anything below the cloud. Yeah, so that's, that's possible. Yes. And you don't don't have a whole lot of coverage from that. Yeah, right. That's for for you know one episode, but you can use this for climatology, just vertical profile of a region for for a period. You can get the yeah. profile from a cloud height. Right. Region. Yeah, but for this kind of scenario, I have looked. Uh, they are mostly for the say the frontal uh, lifting of the pollution from China, for example. Right. And you, you you see those uh, over clouds, and you you can get uh, some sense about the height of the plume that way. Yeah. So That's climatology, true. the coverage may not be as good as, for example, NO2. People have done, been doing cloud slicing for NO2, but uh, SO2 is uh, not, not been done so far. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question. Uh, you are, uh, you are PCA. You use actual kind of corruption events or something like that? I use data that I exclude those uh, large volcanic uh, affected pixels. No volcanic. Yeah, so, so so you can add uh, one step in which you can just uh, by, say, the ratio of uh, radiance uh, between different wavelengths, you can detect those pixels with, say, 5 dU of SO2 in the stratosphere from the volcanic eruptions. Those actually have an impact on your principal components. So you exclude those pixels first, and then you do your training. So I was, you know, I, I, I do uh, ozone retrieve. Mm -hmm. So I was think if no volcanic eruption, mm -hmm. or don't feel be very homogeneous. Yeah, it's very, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. But if you, uh, you they have uh, volcanic eruption, mm -hmm. you get this, you get uh, this, uh, this uh, disturbance. Right. That means that effect is total from volcanic eruption. Yeah. So that we can estimate how big the volcanic eruption, the SO2. Yeah, that's, that's, that's almost a, yeah. yeah. So yeah. we can use that to train your PCA. Well, uh, not, yeah, or, yeah, I mean, it's a very similar idea, but what you just said is almost exactly what the Colin Kruger did uh, 35 years ago. Yeah, yeah, we, we think that if, if you know, we, we, we need uh, uh, our ozone uh, product very, you know, active, so that we, we need to uh, remove all those volcanic uh, effects uh -huh. uh, so you will get very good uh, SO2 in retrieve, which just minus this effect to get you know, very yeah. in the uh, ozone. So that means this bias can be actually SO2 minus. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, the uh, this 8th uh, air pollution. Mm -hmm. Then you show the, uh, the effect of this. Uh, this uh, the, the east the boundary layer. Right. Then you show the transportation. Also, you see. Uh, oh, that, for that way, using the 8, eight, eight kilometers. But, yeah. yeah, so as far as my understanding, the, your Jacobis is sensitive to like the vertical profiles and all the other things. but. Is it sensitive to the emissions, as Steve mentioned? So if you put the ship emissions there or not, will it change your Jacobis? Uh, then, well, then you are changing the profile, so so that will have an impact on the Jacobians, yes. But, I, I mean, the ship track is normally much smaller than the pixel of uh, OMI, the size of a pixel of OMI, I think. Uh, but for tr from trough OMI, we may be able to get something. <laughs> Oh, but even if it's smaller than the pixel, you know, you could exclude maybe it's high, you know, with high emissions. Right. But those times tend yeah. to be yeah. smaller. Yeah. That might include. Right. Yeah. Because we know that the ships carry transponders, so they actually track the ocean uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. and so yeah. on. Yeah. So they have some pretty good information of what they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when they're out in the ocean. Yeah. Now, in recent years, the sulfur content is mandated to go down. So yes. That's a problem. Yeah, I think trouble is in the 
one position to observe that change if we can pull that out. But I don't think you can do that with the. Uh, oh, but you you keep. But I'm not. But I'm going the other way around. Right. Yeah. That way doesn't. I'm not. Yeah. Like for sure. It doesn't matter so much. We know a lot. Of it should. Mm -hmm. so it's not so much uncertainty. Right. Improve your. Right. Yeah. But I in the uh, detailed uh, implementation of the algorithm, I, I do have a scheme that try to detect detectable uh, pixels with detectable SO2. So in a sense, uh, that does not uh, happen very often over the ocean without a volcanic eruption. So, so in that sense, it's, uh, it, it may be there, but the instrument is not sensitive to, to see that. When you add up, it's Yeah. OK, great talk. Let's thank the speaker. <laughs> Thank you.